times <laughs> internalize the message. So there was a lot of Hebrew in the class that I li listened to, and it's a piece of wisdom from one of our Musser giants, Rabbi Dessler. So this is going back over a thousand years ago, this incredible piece of wisdom that was talking about our souls. And as um, we are finishing this book on soul construction, right, we're going to be talking about the last chapter today, which is happiness. Okay, so and, and we'll see if it's going to maybe we'll extend it to next week because there's a lot I want to uh, bring into this class. So talking about the soul construction, which is really the work that we're all doing when we show show up and walk in through these doors, we're, we're, we're exercising a different muscle than most of the world usually exercises. Okay, so we're going to go a little I'm going to give you guys a little insight into our soul right now. Maybe this could expand us in some way, shape or form. Okay, so is anyone here familiar with the story of the book of Yonah, Yonah and the whale, right? The story of Yonah, he was a prophet. He lived in the city of Nineveh. We read the story on Yom Kippur. Is it Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur, okay? Yom Kippur, we read it. It's one of the, the, the Torah readings that we read on the, the Day of Atonement. So there's something very important about the story, but it's a childhood story almost. Like we have lots of colorful picture books about Jonah and the whale. God gives him a mission. He is too scared to step into his soul's mission. His mission is to, to tell the people to do teshuva, to repent, to come back to God. And he runs away. Like, and we know we can't, you can't run away from God. You can't run away from your soul's mission and your calling. It just gets louder in your head. So he runs away. And in this new teaching that I learned, the whole story is an allegory. It's all a parable. Every part of it is connected to something else. So I'm not gonna go so deep into it. Maybe we'll do a whole class on the story before Yom Kippur. But in a nutshell, we have Yonah, we have him running off into, uh, into a boat, going off into the choppy waters. Once he gets on the boat, the waters get worse and worse. There's a terrible storm. All the sailors are trying to figure out what's going on, like God, like whatever gods, because they were actually all idol worshipers. So they're all reaching out to their different gods and different idols saying please like save our lives and then they keep drawing lots like who's the cause of this and it keeps falling on yoda so eventually what happens what happens to yoda gets thrown over or if he probably actually does he say throw me over yes i think he's like uh, he's ready to give up like he's he's he just like that he's the cause, he's the cause. Uh, he can't run away so from god's <laughs> mission for him so he says just throw me over and he throws that he gets thrown over and then the water is calmed down and what happens to yona part two of the story he doesn't just die because you can't run away you can't run away from your from your soul's mission your mission so a huge fish a whale swallows him up and he lives in the belly of the whale for three days. And after those three days, and he's just like, kill me, right? Like enough. But after those three days, God has the whale spit him out onto the dry land because God is giving him another chance to do his mission. And then he goes and he does it. Okay, so that's in a very quick nutshell. Now, the allegory, the parable of each part of this story is very, very interesting. And this is totally new. The boat, is the soul sorry the boat is the body okay the boat is our body all the sailors are the different limbs of our body everyone has a different i'm going to go here i'm going to you know if i if i exercise and if i you know i'm going to take care of this i'm going to feed myself our body has lots of different ways of staying connected to the soul or staying in this world but guess what the boat doesn't always carry us all the way till the end meaning the body sometimes gives up on us the body sometimes starts to detach and it doesn't carry us to the end of the ocean right we think we need to get there but sometimes as we all know with aging parents and we've all lost loved ones and 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 it's, it's you know even when my grandmother died at a hundred years old it was too early we're never ready to give up on someone that we love, but they had so much more to live and so much more to give and so much more love to give. Like we're not ready. But that allegory, that boat is our body. Okay. So that's just very important. And, and then Yona represents the soul, the struggles of the soul within the body. 
and it goes further. Okay, this is every part of the story is actually paralleled to different parts of Jewish life. So when he is thrown into the water and swallowed by a fish, that fish represents anyone want to take a guess? The grave. Okay, the grave is the fish. And actually, Jewish halakha, Jewish law states that for three days after someone is buried, their soul is going through so much turmoil because it's almost like I, I think God gave a class on the soul and the afterlife. There's like this washing machine that our soul needs to go through until it could rest finally. So the first three days are very hard on everyone's soul because we all have misdeeds and mistakes that we've done. So we need to rectify and atone. So hopefully it should be a very quick process until our soul could finally rest. Mm -hmm. But those three days when Yonah is in the stomach of the whale, what does he start doing? He prays. So that's this connection that the soul is seeking, seeking something bigger. Okay, so that's happening over here. And yeah, many, many different parts of the story. Okay, so. Um, okay. So has anyone here ever asked themselves or heard a friend or someone that you're mentoring ask, why is this happening to me? <laughs> that we, we, yes, <laughs> right? And that's like, I think daily, like, why, why is me? this happening to me? Why me, mm -hmm. right? But like we've all been asked that. So this is basically, so this is what's happening because obviously every part of the story, Yona's trying to run away from his, his mission. Right? He doesn't want to do it. It's too hard. Why me? Why me? And um, but but this this obstacle course, this specific mission, and this role that the soul was sent to play in this world, it needs the soul needs to get through certain things to get to the other side. And sometimes that doesn't mean the other side of the water, because sometimes it doesn't make it to the other side of the water. So now let's try to understand what happens to the soul. What happens to the soul? And let's, I, this is like um, a very deep window into the soul, which I, 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 I'm very excited about this, this information. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is like, you know, I, I said this to my husband last night. I, I felt, I, I'm feeling very exhausted. Okay, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Whatever. Like, and, and to be really honest, ever since I had COVID, which was over a year ago, I don't have the same energy. Okay, and I, I can never complain about it because, right? Judy really had hard long COVID, so I, 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 I'm not even complaining about it. But I don't like come nighttime. I'm just I'm I'm white. I don't have like when I have to come here to do an event at night. I literally have to like splash water on my face and be like, let's do this. Like I have to pump myself up because I really would rather crawl into bed at eight o'clock. So, so it's been hard for me to kind of see the change that's happening. And I'm, I'm only 42 years old, right? If I'm feeling weak and tired and exhausted now, like whenever I do complain, like this hurts and that hurts, my husband's like, what are you gonna be complaining for the next 45 years? Yeah. Like, it's just gonna get worse, okay? But, but this, this teaching that as the soul becomes more prominent in our life, the body becomes less so, okay? Get this, as we evolve, as we grow, as we age and mature, because it happens naturally, right? Life puts you through so much that you do have more of an awareness and a deeper understanding that, you know, at, at 20 years old, you feel like you're invincible. But when you're 45, 50 years old, you realize you're halfway through this, this world, right? time is ticking, right? And as we get older, we become more aware of what's important and our body takes a back seat because our soul starts to shine even more. So that's why as we get older, we sleep more. So that, I've never heard that before, but I was always like, oh my gosh, why am I so exhausted? I like, think about my father. My father would come home from work. He'd sit on the couch. He's like, out like a light. Like that was like the custom in our house. He'd sit on the couch. He's sleeping within a minute. But, and obviously as people age, they are sleeping more. Their energy starts to dwindle. I used to be the energizer bunny. Now I'm just like an average. I don't know. Uh, yeah, average. Yeah. But I'm saying, but for me, yeah, yeah. everyone has what they're used to. So when things start to shift, it could feel really scary. 
So, okay, so this is, it's really an important lesson to understand, maybe to help people that are really aging, that it's not a bad thing. She's looking directly at me. No, not at <laughs> me. I always have to focus on one beautiful face. That's it. Okay. We'll go. So isn't that, isn't that profound? It's profound. profound. As the soul becomes more prominent, the body becomes less so. And the body sleeps more because it doesn't need the body. It, it's like taking a back seat. And it just continues and continues until 120 at the end of our lives. Wait, look at me when you say 120. 120. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, it's just profound. But as people that are talking and, and working and learning about things of spirituality, and we want to have a deeper understanding of our soul, mm -hmm. I just think like this piece of information, I don't know, first of all, it just makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem as scary anymore. Like it's okay to age because there's something amazing waiting on the other side. I mean, I, I never quite understood other ways of, of living and death, like other religions, other, you know, my, one of my best friends, she's a Japanese Jew by choice. If anyone has heard me talk about Tia Winnegar, right, you know Tia. Jew. So she's, a, she's from Japanese descent and she's the most fabulous gift to the Jewish world. And I remember when her grandmother passed, I was, it was my first experience with someone so close to me. I didn't know how to comfort her because they don't have, they didn't have a process. It was, it was, there was a cremation. There was, you know, a month later, they got together to sprinkle the ashes. There was no Shiva. There was no burial. There was no Shiva. There was no month period of mourning. There was, there's no uric sites, nothing. There's no candles. Like everything that we talk about, about the soul, it, it should be the greatest mm. gift to not feel afraid for what's next to come. Right? It really should just give us reassurance that we're, in fact, our sages tell us that, so Judaism says that this world is just the corridor right. to the next world. Right. Yeah, this is the, the, it says cross door, which is like the hallway to the ulam, to the banquet hall, which is our soul living on for all eternity. It always was, our souls existed from, you know, souls live under God's heavenly chest of heavenly throne, whatever we, however we can imagine that. There is this uh, treasure chest of souls. Souls are there. They come down for a brief blip in time and then they go back up and they have all different types of reincarnations and different, different things that the journey of the soul goes through. But we only have this 100, 120 years, please God, to do that work. Okay, yeah. question. In, in light of that, there's a story about the Chafet Chaim, and we, I don't know if we talked about it here, but um, I heard it many times, and he was a, a great, great sage, mm -hmm. and um, he lived in a very, very, very mm -hmm. modest little hot house, whatever, and um, he had, in there, there was a right. table, and some, a couple chairs, and a bed, and that was it. And he had a visitor and he came to this his house and he said, Where's your such, stuff? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're such a great man. Your house, you know, and the Hufferstein answer is classic. He said, I'm just traveling through. <laughs> yeah, very powerful. He actually, to add on to that story, yes. it was known that by his door, he his had suitcase. his little yeah. satchel, like his little suitcase. Yeah. It was always packed. For Mashiach. Yeah. Right. Like he really yeah. lived with a otherworldly openness. Like this is this is not the real mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. You said that there is no York site if someone's claiming well, it. Is that? I don't know. So no, that no, 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 That's a Japanese. My mom actually created yeah. it and we yeah. did. So that's what she wants. So my mom, my mom actually converted and she and my mom had a story because her mom, her mom died when she was pretty young and she had joy in she wasn't given a choice of anything with her mother. And she always said to us that she wanted to be cremated because she knows we're not going to visit her and blah, blah, blah. So we, she was, she died during COVID. And even mm -hmm. though, um, so she, and she was cremated and was actually, we did everything else except for the burial because that's right. her wishes. And so um, we did, and well, we couldn't do Shiva, mm -hmm. but we did as much right. as we could and did the yard side and we still did, you know, wow. but yes. Yeah. And so, but um, I, I know that that's typically not done. 
Right, but Tia, but that was, Tia converted. Yeah. But her grandmother did. Convert, yeah, her grandmother so did. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm sure they yeah. did some. Yeah. Like, they yeah. had to get together. Like everyone yes. does. But but there was not. I don't know. The time. The time right. of Judaism is all there to comfort us oh, and yes. also to help elevate yes. the soul. Like what we do, yes. what you do, how you elevated, you know, your mom's yes. soul. Like that. That was so special. Like that's that's all that could happen because mm -hmm. once the soul leaves the body. It no longer could yeah. do any deeds. So we need to now do yes. the deeds for the person, for the soul, not the person. But yeah, and I'm, just, I'm so sorry, but thank you for sharing. And, and yeah. really, everyone does what, what they do. And I'm not poking, I'm just saying there is a process that is a gift, okay? It's a gift of helping, helping the soul. Okay, so, so let's, let's get back to this piece. Um, okay, da, 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 da. Okay, so there is um, one of the morning prayers. We say, Kolzman Shahanashama Bikir B, right? Which means every at every moment that the soul is within me, right? And then, then it goes on mm -hmm. to say, like, I could give praise, I could do things, I could do all this stuff. Okay, so as soon as the Nishama separates from the body, as I said, then it, you know, that, that person ceases to exist. Okay, so as long as the soul and the body are in connection with each other, that's, that's being alive. And as soon as that disconnection or separation happens, that's when the physical becomes, it becomes, I mean, the body is buried, you know, in your case, cremated. Like, it's, it's a nothing. It's really, it's dust and ashes. There's nothing there, but the soul lives on forevermore. So now I want to go into the soul. Okay, so this, this soul experience, so here is what Rabbi Dessler says. Every single person is born into this world with all of the spiritual potential that they will ever have in their entire life, okay? So you're born just like a woman, a girl, a baby girl is born complete with every egg and everything she needs to reproduce her future generations. In that same light, so too, every single soul is brought into this world in its entirety with its full potential. But here is the crazy thing. A soul is like a camera. It could take pictures of everything, but what? So itself. A camera can never take a picture of itself, right? Well, it could it's have about well, selfie. <laughs> Even, even today, I mean, we take like a selfie in a, in a, in a mirror and you can see the reflection, but the actual camera cannot take a picture of itself. That's just the example that is used. <laughs> That really tries to help us explain that we cannot see our entire soul. We cannot see it until the soul leaves the body. And that's when we're given the first glimpse of what our soul was all about. Now, why would God do this? Why wouldn't we be born with a little tag coming out of our tuchus telling <laughs> us what our mission is, right? It would be so much easier. Why, why is it so challenging? Because literally Rabbi Dessler is explaining that our whole soul is present, but there's only a sliver that is open to us at every moment in time, a glimpse into our soul. We get a little teeny slit, a little opening into our soul at every single moment, but we never see the whole thing in its entirety while we're alive. It's only afterwards that we see it. And by the way, that is heaven and hell, as many of our Jewish sources explain, that when we die and our soul now disconnects and it gets to see itself and see its full potential, the heaven is seeing what it did to actualize its potential and the hell is seeing what it didn't do. And there's nothing, isn't that crazy? That's one Jewish interpretation of heaven and hell. Heaven is, wow, I took this diamond in the rough and I shined it and made this beautiful mm -hmm. life for myself of kindness and giving and, and chesed and all types of things. I gave and I gave <laughs> and I gave with my life, right? That you have reward forevermore versus the opposite. So there's actually three things that could happen at every single moment, okay? Number one, we could actualize this moment of inspiration and spirituality, you could act on it, right? I loved how Julie came in. Oh, it's the fundraiser. I got to get my phone. And she's like, let me do it right now because a moment comes and a moment goes. 
And there's lots of people I was making phone calls the whole morning while driving. And I noticed that a lot of people didn't pick up the phone. They know, right? I'm so sorry, I missed the fundraiser. That's a moment. You can take it, you can leave it, it's up to you. I mean, I, you know, we could, nothing I could do about it. But we have these every single moment, there is this slit, this opening to your, okay, so, so this, is, this is like, if you know Hebrew, this is kind of a cute play on words but the word goofy, okay, goofy, like sounds like goofy, like silly. Goofy is like silly, right? right. But actually goof is my body. body. So goofy is hagu shelly, my body. So um, the teacher that sent me this teaching, she actually explains that, that like she, she actually, she sent me a video and she had like a cloak or some type of a coat and it had like a little slit in it, like, like an opening. And she was explaining that really, as we all know, that the body is just the scuba suit for the soul. It's the vessel that holds the soul. We need the body, right? But we also know that we are a soul. We have a body, okay? We are a soul. We have a body. That outer coat, that scuba suit, however you want to visualize <laughs> That part that takes up so much of our time and energy and effort, it's not even us. It's not even us. The main part of us is the spiritual part, okay? So we said there is actualizing, there's, there's a middle way, and then there's unfortunately another option. There's three options with every moment in time for our soul. One is actualizing, two is ignoring and three is perverting now i don't know if the word perverting sits so well with me because i think it's very rare that we pervert a moment but there definitely are people that will pervert a beautiful moment but let's not use that word because it didn't sit well with me i want to use fail because we all fail right we have a moment you could take it and run with it or you could you could ignore it like all the people that i called this morning <laughs> or you could fail. And then that's okay because we also know that you get back up and you try again. Like we're all, we all fail. That's okay. Okay. So those are the three options at every moment in time. Any questions? I, I thought this was I really was powerful. Failing. Is failing like you've tried it or is failing like you decide not to do it? Or you like, aren't you purposely? There's probably so many permutations of, of failing, meaning okay. like, meaning kids come home from school. And I'm not in my, I'm, I did not sleep well the night before. So I'm very short tempered. So ignoring would be better <laughs> than lashing out. Yes. Okay. okay. But, but every single person in this room, we all know that we've lost it at many times. So that's why I don't want to use the word perverting or even sinning. It's just a failure. Like, and so some things are more extreme, but some things are just daily occurrences. But there's always those three options, and that's it. Are we going to rise? Are we going to, are we going to fall? Are we going to maybe, maybe hold the moment? Not, not do either. Maybe we need more time, which by the way, our sages tell us that the crown jewel of all traits is alacrity. We spoke about this. We did a class on it. It's resuit. Because with that, with, with the ability to like take a moment and run with it, you're, you're going to do so much more in your life. So if you want to like, where do I start with, with like building my character traits? Some of our sages say, become someone that gets things done. Become someone that does things with three dudes, like alacrity. Like, let's just do it. Okay, what's the big deal? Let's do it. Like, don't overthink everything, you know? So just to like act in the moment, okay? Any questions? Yes. Well, it's more of a comment. Um, when you were talking about um, the soul becoming more prominent than the body, and certainly, and Susie and I, we studied Dessler and we didn't even study the Jonah story, but I realize I've shifted in my stage of life, my chapter, from understanding that and simply calling it my priorities have changed. Love mm -hmm. it. And what you've given to us, it's just our priorities. It's actually something that's happening within the Jewish soul. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was very helpful to me. Wow. You know, because we all talk about our priorities at different times in our mm -hmm. life, how they should. It's not just that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the conscious 
the way to look at it. The other way to look at it is what you're describing, which is it's actually happening in your soul. Right. Your body. right. It's really beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful, it's but helpful. it's also it's a conversation that many people are uncomfortable having or even going there, even thinking about because because we just want to be in the here and out, mm -hmm. which is something very interesting because we don't, how come we don't walk through this world as just regular human beings? Why don't we walk with all of our past and all of the dreams for our future? We don't, we forget about that. Mm -hmm. Every now and then we get inspired. Oh, I really came from a wonder, wonderful grandparents or ancestors. We carry that with us. And we also, many of us have big lofty goals and dreams for the, for the Jewish people, for our community, whatever that is. But it's not in the front of our mm -hmm. lives every moment. We're just trying to get through the day, right? And I think it's all part of God's, God's plan of, of almost blinding us a little bit to our past, to our future, to all of the potential, just like God won't show us our soul in its entirety, because if he did that, we wouldn't have free will. So we have to, we have to get through this murky waters, this world that's very turbulent and confusing, while still finding times to focus on spirituality. It's very easy not to. It's very easy to, to just live a very, very mundane physical existence. There, I, I'm just going to tie in a story that I remember sharing at, at Bruce's uh, when, we, when we opened the, the learning center over here. You remember that? I barely knew you then. No, I'm looking at Dana. I barely knew her and I came and I, I, I feel like I got to know your, your dad. Allah hashalam, his, his soul should, should always be in peace in heaven. So the story that I shared then was the story of, of a very wealthy, well-known man, Mr. Wolfson. Okay? Everyone knows the name Wolfson, millionaire, maybe a billionaire in the Jewish world. He's actually from my hometown in Toronto. Everyone knows the Wolfson family. Oh, sorry. The Reichman family. It was the Reichman family, Mr. Reichman. So as he was coming closer to his, and he was feeling that his soul was slowly, slowly leaving his body, he gathered his kids. And he told them he has one final dying wish. Sure, dad, anything. He says, I want to be buried in my socks. <laughs> and his kids looked at each other. So this family had become, they, they were observant Jews. They're a big part of, the prominent part of the, the Orthodox community in Toronto. And part of the law is a burial. is to buried in simple shrouds, linen, white shrouds, and nothing else. It, the, the shrouds don't have a pocket. You can't take anything with you. All he asked was to be buried in a pair of socks. His kids thought, okay, he's really losing it. But, and obviously they buried their father without his socks because there was no rabbi that would allow them to honor that request. So about a month later, they came together. All the kids came together to read the will. And it said, dear children, by now you have buried me without my socks. <laughs> he said, I just want you to know that even someone like me had millions and billions of dollars, I couldn't even leave this world, even with a pair of socks, because we take nothing physical with us. Yeah. What a lesson for his kids. Like as he's passing the torch onto them to become the givers of the Jewish people for the next generation, empowering them to realize, to recognize that it's not about this world. It's about so much more than that. Right? Don't get lost in your richness. Don't get lost in your money, which is very, very common for us to do. We get so absorbed in the next thing and the next thing. And even someone very, very wealthy, it's never enough. If you're in that pursuit, it's never enough. It's never going to be enough. Right? Unless you stop and you focus that, yes, these are gifts. I'm going to use them for the good. And I am a spiritual person that's going to live forevermore. So I need to get near it. I need to get scar, that, that beautiful reward that I could only get from good deeds in this world. Yes. A shroud has no pockets. That's right. There's nothing you could take with you. That's an old Yiddish saying. It's not mine. Right. Okay. Right. I, I mean, I, I've, heard, I've heard stories like of someone like that, that was buried like in his Corvette. <laughs> like, I mean, I've heard stories. Good like, for him. I mean, it's okay. You know, it's, 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 I'm not making any judgments. Like, but, but, and maybe that pleases someone while they're in this world, right? That that's, if that's their dying request, I get it. I get it. I mean, not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> but 
whatever <laughs> there is a do, right? no judgment because 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 maybe that person didn't have the understanding or the knowledge right. to know that there's so much more than that physical you yeah, know totally. toy or, really, yeah. right or whatever it is I get that. yeah I, if there's very, very few cases that I've heard of, of things being buried, like in a, in, in a, a very high, because um, I've worked with in the Hever Kedisha. So, mm. so even, even when someone comes with something on them that they want to be buried with them, um, it's very, very rare that they'll allow anything to go in the grave. I think there are some cases, but um, like, for example, I mean, this is kind of a weird example. So don't, don't just be open-minded, be open-minded, okay? <laughs> okay? It's a little, but it's actually, it's, it's beautiful if you could find the beauty in it. There was a rabbi that passed away about two years ago, Rabbi um, Wallerstein, the book come up. Ooh. He was a giant. There's mm -hmm. books that, are, that have just recently come out, written about his life. He just cared for every single Jew and what he did for them. And he really worked with girls that, are, that were really struggling. He opened homes for them, girls that were abused. He had, he had schools. He had places for them to mm -hmm. study. He, he took care of so many girls. And these girls, many of them were living on, on the streets. So in his talus bag, and this only came out after he died, in his talus bag that he walked, he went to synagogue every single day, took his talus bag with him. He had a small collection of piercings, of, of earrings. And all these girls were girls from Orthodox homes and they, many of them were covered in piercings. I had no judgment towards piercings. I mean, we, right? All of us have our ears pierced. But many of them had all types of piercings. And every time a girl would get stronger and stronger and maybe start building her own Jewish family, eventually they might have said, you know, like, I'm, I'm done with piercing number 37. And, <laughs> and would, you know, give one of these piercings to Rabbi Wallerstein. And he collected them. They were his jewels. They were his, again, maybe, maybe it's, it was a physical reminder. Not that there's anything wrong with piercings. It was just, this was what he collected. This was his little collection. And, and they actually put that bag of piercings in his grave. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I think that's a true story. I definitely went around. I heard it from many different people. It's just interesting. I mean, we're all going to need to go up and like, kind of like say like, God, like I did good things, you know? Yeah. So for him, it was, that was his way of saying like, look at all these girls that I, yeah. I brought closer to getting on, back on their feet and creating right. healthy lives and who knows. Yeah. It's not that a male could get, could get buried in their shroud and their towel. Mm -hmm. So good point. Um, so it's usually a shroud, bear, but it's usually a shroud. And then very often the talis will also be wrapped. So it, you know, in Israel, we don't bury in a coffin. Right, so it's only a talus. Everyone is buried in a talus in Israel. Um, one of the one of the funerals that that we did in Portland, which is a very green kind of city, um, so I think there was the option to do with a, a coffin without a coffin. So, um, so if you guys know about my dear friend Tony Jaffe, who's now on the board of the Chaim Center, so unfortunately her son passed away from an overdose and. And we buried him in in Gadi's talis. Wow. It was like it was like the most beautiful, heartbreaking. It was the talis that Gadi used at his chupa that I bought wow. from Meza. And it was just our expression of love was to wrap him in that talis, and there was no coffin. So it was just like I'll never forget that image. So there is there's different ways. I think in Chicago, I mean, unfortunately, I've been to so many funerals here, and. It's, it's very different how it, like there's almost like they, they put down that big slab of cement. Oh, I've never seen that in any other place. Right. Right? I've never seen that anywhere. I've never seen that in any other place. So I think it's different in every place. And a talus is definitely, so they don't, a they talus don't. is almost like a shroud. Like there's nothing to but it. They, it's a white I just remember my yeah. grandfather, he was shrouded, but he also had a shroud. Yeah, so that's by his request. Yeah, 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 it was a lot. Yeah, that's, so that's, it's almost like, I mean, part of, of the shrouding of the body, so you do the shrouds as all these different pieces of clothing, right? Fava, you could, you could probably speak more to this because um, I've never done it here in Chicago. So it could be it's done a little differently. But in Portland, in Portland, it, before we put the body in the coffin, we would put a big white, almost like a sheet, like a white linen piece, which could be like a talus, right? Put that in and that also was like, almost like at the last, Encasing so talis or shroud or whatever it is, really the same idea. Just not mm -hmm. just not that. Okay, so how do they do that? I'm just curious. They always feel like in Israel. 
Yeah, I feel like you see the big in Israel, no one is buried in a. In a so we just round the earth. Yeah. Right. Go back I mean, to the earth. To be to be honest, my first jarring experience. <laughs> uh, my first jarring experience doing do, doing like my very first um, volunteering for the Chaver Kedisha. I didn't know what I was doing, and I get there, and I'm really really scared because I've actually never come into contact with a dead body before, and all of a sudden there's a dead body on, on the table in front of me and there's a lot of action and we're filling up water and putting <laughs> the wood and we're creating this whole mix of experience but literally the, the first moment that i walked into that experience my my leader my co uh, you know donna cutner this incredible woman who became like my rebbitson she um she hands me a power drill okay, i don't know if you do this in chicago but this was a non-jewish funeral home that we were doing a jewish tahara at <laughs> She a power drill to literally drill holes in the bottom of the coffin because it wasn't prepared for a Jew. Like in the the ones here, are they made with holes? Okay, they already have holes. So in this funeral home, it was a regular polished fancy um, box, and there were no holes. And according to Jewish custom, if you're going to use a box, it has to have holes in it on the bottom so that you want the body to become one with the earth. Because we're, we come from the earth and we go back to the earth. And there's so much, it's so simple. It's like the body is, it's going to be, it's nothing. The body is nothing. It's the soul that goes on forever. Do you want to do it now? Look at, look okay, at go the for topic it. Go for it. is, I mean, I yeah, so I told you, this is my is, This is too go strange. Okay, so I'll pass these away. Oh, my goodness. So we're going to do a little intermission. Okay. Um, go ahead. Come, come stand oh, up over come here. Stand over here. Will you pass these on yeah, the side? Yeah. <laughs> so without knowing where this conversation was going today, I have a um, I have a poem that I, um, I, I I'm dating myself. Xeroxed. Um, I was uh, I was with my sister. Um, I'll I'll wait till everyone gets it, but I'll just give an intro. We were, um, my sister is like, I'm not going to say, it. she fights me on Jew Jewish stuff, like she doesn't want to go into the world of it. Um, so she, she loves like poetry, which is my background as well. And I said, she, she goes, I don't want to talk about Jew Jewish things for a minute. Let's talk about poetry. So I said, okay. So she opened <laughs> her uh, book of poems and lo and behold she's looking through and we were at Henry Wadsworth Longfellow um, and she said she's reading something and she's looking down and she's like oh my god Janice you have to read this poem and it's called the Jewish Cemetery at Newport which is you know it's all kind of just very tied in this moment it's kind of giving me chills it's very interesting okay so Henry Wadsworth Longfellow uh, uh, did this poem I, you guys know Hiawatha yeah. okay he did uh, this, he wrote this poem in uh, 1854 I was born in 1954 so it's exactly 168 years old <laughs> um, so without further ado I mean I can't believe the, the lead up to this, let's go. How strange it seems, these Hebrews in their graves, close by the street of this fair seaport town, silent beside the never silent waves, at rest in all this moving up and down. The trees are white with dust that o'er their sleep wave their broad curtains in the south wind's breath while underneath these leafy tents they keep the long mysterious exodus of death. And these sepulcher stones so old and brown that pave with level flags their burial place seem like the tablets of the law thrown down and broken by Moses at the mountain's base. The very names recorded here are strange of foreign accent and of different climes, Alvarez <laughs> and Rivera interchange with Abraham and Jacob of old times. 
Blessed be God, for he created death, the mourners said, and death is rest in peace. Then added in the certainty of faith, and giveth life that nevermore shall cease. Closed are the portals of their synagogue. No Psalms of David, now the silence break. No rabbi reads the ancient Decalogue. In the grand dialect, the prophets spake. Gone are the living, but the dead remain, and not neglected for a hand unseen. Scattering its bounty like a summer rain, still keeps their graves and their remembrance green. How came they here? What burst of Christian hate, what persecution merciless and blind, drove o'er the sea, that desert desolate, these Ishmaels and Hagers of mankind. They lived in narrow streets and lanes obscure, ghetto and Judenstrass in murk and mire, taught in the school of patience to endure their life, the life of anguish and the death of fire. All their lives long with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs of exile and its fears, the wasting famine of the heart they fed and slaked its thirst with Mara of their tears. And anathema, anathema Marantha, Marantha was the cry that rang from town to town, from street to street. At every gate, the accursed Mordechai was mocked and jeered and spurned by Christian feet. Pride and humiliation, hand in hand, walked with them through the world wherever they went. Trampled and beaten were they as the sand, and yet unshaken as the continent. For in the background figures vague and vast of patriarchs and of prophets rose sublime, and all the great traditions of the past they saw reflected in the coming time. And thus forever with, re with reverted look, the mystic volume of the word world they read, spelling it backward like a Hebrew book, to life became a legend of the dead. But ah, what once has been shall be no more. The groaning earth in travail and in pain brings forth its races, but does not restore, and the dead nations never rise again. You want to you wanted to share a little bit of, of your thoughts on this and why you wanted to share this with us? Well, it's a lot to do with you. Um, I think that it's amazing that an American poet would have such a sense ability of our background and extract such salient points about who we are and what we are and, and our life of struggle and everything. And because I was struggling too, and Eve kind of found me and I feel like I'm back and just everything feels really good now that I'm back and my Judaism. It's a connection that is, there's nothing like it, ladies. And I'm sure that's why you're all here, but kudos to Eve, just the pintle of yid. She gave mm -hmm. me the spark. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. You had the spark. Expands it a little. You fanned it, correct? Right? In the aisles of. Uh, the Woe Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. which is which is gutted <laughs> now. I literally yeah, picked totally her up gutted. in the aisles of Barnes and Noble. It's really interesting that it's an American uh, poet. You know, yeah, that's yeah, that yeah. that I find I'm like, how is it knowing all this? And this is in the 1800s. I don't know. It's just 1854. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. yeah. yeah. It, is. it is. Wow. Okay, so so stay here. Okay, because uh, that's just like an HP moment though, because the <laughs> fact that you're talking about you like when we're in Israel, we always talked about our HPs. Right. You Higher just experienced power loss because we did talk about this, and then mm -hmm. this was not my class title yeah. topic, by the yeah. way. So this was all. It wasn't. You don't want to say that. I'm just. I'm sorry. But I, I, I'm a Debbie Downer. No, it's not. It's not because they feel like there's. We have a very elevated understanding. Of, of who we are and we're so it's what a blessing it is to live in this world without the fear of, of what's going to happen after after we leave this world that that there's all eternity so I, I love the the past the present the future 
like connecting to this poem from over a hundred and you said 68 years mm -hmm. ago. 168 and there's years. so much wisdom that still talks to us. It could have been written today. Right. And the fact that it's American, I mean, how does that make you guys feel that Hiawatha and all the American, mm -hmm. but, but look how this, this poet felt us. It, isn't it amazing? It's mm -hmm. really amazing. Well, it's like Mark Twain, what right. he wrote about the Jews, too. Oh, he wrote about the Jews. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, he he did a lot of good things. Oh, a lot like of it. good things. Yeah. He said, we went through time with our hands tied behind our back. It was a, it's a beautiful passage. I, I, I should have brought it, but I didn't think of it. And that we did everything and we still survived. Yeah. You know, like we were always at disadvantage. That's how Mark Twain saw us. So I'm gonna to try to close some of these beautiful concepts. We're gonna, we'll bring, we'll bring this past, but close, I guess today we spoke about the soul and next time we'll speak about happiness, okay? Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. So, so this is just um, a story that a friend of mine, Debbie Greenblatt, who taught me this lesson of Rabbi Dessler. I, I listened to her class this week and I gleaned some of the wisdom. So she shares a, a story that it could be all of our stories. I think we'll all get a little chuckle out of this. Debbie has been a part of, of helping connect Jews to their Judaism, just like I do. She does it in New York. She was part of this organization called Gateways, which would bring it back in the day when it was much more popular to be strongly Jewish. So now it's, you guys are the rare, <laughs> you guys are the rarest people um, in the Jewish nation. There aren't so many Jews that want to be Jewish nowadays. But back in the 80s, when people were really drinking it in, she would make these Shabbatons as part of the Gateway staff, and they would have over 500 individuals signing up, sold out every single time. Okay, so she's at this Shabbaton, and this was every few months, they would have another Shabbaton in New York. And this man comes, he's a scientist, he's an intellectual type of guy, he's sitting with Debbie and her husband, and he says, in all these classes, you guys mentioned the soul. I don't believe the soul. I, we're all a bunch of molecules that have come together. And, you know, he's like talking like a scientist. And he says, I don't believe in the soul. He says, this is my fifth gateway Shabbaton. And I still don't believe Why in the soul. Come back? So, exactly. So Debbie <laughs> chuckles and she says, what do you think got him to this Shabbaton? Like clearly <laughs> the soul is leading him, right? He might not see it because as I said, we don't see our soul until afterwards. We're just every moment have a glimpse into the spiritual capacity and potential to either actualize it, ignore it, or God forbid, pervert it or fail or, or leave it, you know, do, you know, there's different things that could happen. So, so that was just one story. And, and I could think of many, many stories of, of, of this where, where we see a soul, right? And, and for us, whoever knows our little story of coming together, I'm sitting, drinking my Starbucks. My kids are looking at books. It was the first and only time I was ever in this, in this Barnes and Nobles store that is now demolished. It was like, literally, like I've never been there. I've lived here for two years, never once walked in. One day I'm like, I want a Starbucks and I just want to sit and read a magazine. Kids, buy yourself one book, go look, give me a few minutes of quiet. And I hear two aisles over, I hear Janice asking the sales lady, do you have any books on Judaism and mm -hmm. spirituality? And I'm like, ding, like, I'm like, and, and, and it was painful to hear the sales lady say like, I think we have a Haggadah. It was like the summertime. <laughs> I know. I was like, no, 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 no. So of course I, that was my cue and I get up and I, and I go over, but it's just, it's amazing how mm -hmm. Hashem is, this is, I mean, your soul brought you there. Yeah, oh, my soul sure. and my soul's mission got me out of my comfortable chair to say, hi, how are you? My you name said, is I Annie. got this. <laughs> I come to a class, like, I, you know, come to the Lachayim Center. And I try not to be, you know, we don't uh, proselytize. Like we don't, I, we don't, we're not like aggressive in any way, but clearly this is a Jewish soul on a journey looking for something, right? There's always that opening and that moment. And we all need to find it and actualize that moment because the op what happens otherwise is when our soul is so thirsty and hungry for something and we don't hear or listen or understand what the need is, we try to fill the, that hole in our soul with something else. Yeah. And that thing is probably not a healthy thing. Yeah. It very, very likely might be an addiction or an obsession or, or no, and sometimes it could be a healthy obsession. It could be, I've seen people mm -hmm. obsessed with, with health or obsessed with exercise or obsessed with 
all types of good things, or even learning or work, or, you know, it could be, but there's a little balance that's off because, and I think this is Adrian Gould that once said, if I spend an hour on my physical self, can I also spend an hour on my spiritual self? Like, how do we find that balance where we're tuning in to also hearing that still, but strong voice of our soul? So that I think is our work. So I'm gonna give you guys a little homework to close this off because we are going into a very auspicious time for the mm -hmm. Jewish people. Thursday night and Friday night are two nights that we light candles for the holiday. Like, and on Friday night, we'll lahadli k'ner shal Shabbos v'yamta. So it's the both. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everyone should light candles. If you need any help, if you need any details how to do that, call me. I'll, I'll walk you through it. You, ha you have a urine site candle from Thursday night, and then you light from that 25-hour candle for Friday night. So you don't even need to light. It's already there. And, and I think what we all need to do is find just a moment where we could try to have a little silence so we can actually hear that voice of our soul because we don't usually hear it. It's so drowned out by all the other noise and chaos and wants of our physical lives that very often it takes a backseat and we know that that is really who we are. So we need to start listening more and tapping into it to get us until the other side, to get us through this stormy, stormy raging sea, like the book of Yona. We want our body to carry us as far through this journey as possible, but really ultimately it's all about the journey of the soul in this world. So I think we'll end here with that. And um, if anyone wants to stay, we'd love to have you stay. We're gonna be here, right Gali? Do you wanna say anything? We're gonna be making calls and Gali could lead us and we'll, we'll have lots of rah rock. And then tonight, tonight Gali and I Friday, right? will be speaking here, Wheel of Wisdom at 7.30, 7.30 till 8.30 or so. We're gonna be speaking about gratitude. So a really, really important topic for all of us as Jews, the Yehudim, we're the people of gratitude. So we really need to understand how to do that well. So that's tonight. And then tomorrow all day, hitting the phones with this campaign. So if you know anyone that you like, might wanna call and say like, I'm, I'm in love with Little Time Center. I know it means nothing to you, but maybe you have the means to help support it. You know, you could send the link to people that, that might care. It's basically giving other people an opportunity of being a part of this. It's really, I, I'm stopping to, I used to feel so like, I can't ask for money. I hate, I, I hate that. I hate fundraising. I'm not a fundraiser. I will never ask anyone for anything. I just want to see a pure soul in front of me. But you know what? I'm putting that, that aside because I actually believe that we are giving people the opportunity, the opportunity, the gift of giving. Givers are happy people, mm -hmm. right? There's a million beautiful quotes out there that we I also, can read you, but hold on, hold on one second. We put it at the bottom of our letter, you know, let us know if there's a special charity day. Love that. Yeah. Let me, let me, these are some that you are aware of, but I'll end with this, okay? If you know who said this, tell me. No one has ever become poor by giving. And Frank, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Winston Churchill. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Mahatma Gandhi. We rise by lifting others. Robert Ingersoll. Remember that the happiest people are not those getting more, but those giving more. That's H. Jackson Brown Jr. And last one, Giving is not just about making a donation, it's, a, it's about making a difference. Happy Calvin. So maybe I'll be part of this, be, being on the giving end our entire lives and, and may Hashem bless you with lots of merit and reward in this world and in the next. Thank you guys. I'm gonna be here all day. You know what I mean, guys? We're all gonna be here all day. Yeah. Huh? We're going to be here all day. I know you guys are going to be here all day.